Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. There are people in New York who counsel some of the most prominent real estate developers and leaders. But there are people who have made themselves institutions by, by representing these people. One of those guys is a person that you constantly see on a show called The Apprentice. But I'm going to tell you the life story of the Brooklyn-born George Ross today who is the executive vice president and senior counsel at the Trump Organization. Thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure. So you were born in Brooklyn, right? Uh, 1928. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, you originally near Prospect Park, and That's then right. then your father, that you moved to the Bronx, right? That's right. And your father was in the uh, millinery? That's right. And when you were growing up, you wanted to become an engineer, and you were going to go to. You went to Stuyvesant High School. That's correct. What happened next? You well, I didn't. I had to, I had the grades to at Stuyvesant uh, to be an engineer, but unfortunately. And you wanted to go to MIT, correct? I wanted to go to MIT, which was fine. I think my father could have swung it at the time, but unfortunately, he died when I was sixteen, 16. and that eliminated my possibility of going to MIT as well as going to college. So what happens then? Then you... Uh... Then uh, at that time, I was alone with my mother. My two brothers were in the Army. And the only way that I saw I could possibly get to college was to enlist in the Army when I was 17. And they said if I did that, they would send me to a college until I was 18, then I'd go on active duty. So they sent you to Clemson. They did. That was a different place for a kid from uh, New York City. A different place for a kid from New York City, absolutely true. And so you, then you finished, you you, grad, you leave the Army when you were, what, 19? Uh, 20? No, I was in the Army one year and eight days on active duty. I was a cryptanalyst. And then they wanted me to sign up for two years. I said, no, uh, I'll take what was then called the duration plus six. And then they they discharged me. And then you went to Brooklyn College That's on the correct. GI Bill. That's right. And you were living in Brooklyn at this time? That's right. I was uh, living with my mother in Brooklyn. And subsequently, you decide to become an attorney. I mean, your father, no family members were, were ever an attorney. No. How did you decide that you wanted to become an attorney? Uh, while I was going to Brooklyn College to get, I figured I'd have to get a degree, I was interested in political science. And I thought that it would be a good idea to have the background of being a lawyer. So I would go to law school. So you, you graduate Brooklyn, you go to Brooklyn Law School in, in downtown Brooklyn, and during that time, you see an ad in the Law Journal 
for this legendary law firm who only did real estate by the name of Dreyer and Traub. What, what happened? Well, actually, I didn't know it was a legendary law firm when I applied to the ad. The ad said law clerk wanted, and I applied to, basically to a law clerk. And uh, at the time, the the one who was doing the who was doing the interviewing was a was had I'd gone to law school with a guy named Bill Cohn, who was very good, and he basically said, "George, don't take the job. Don't you don't want to be here? You'll be a messenger. You won't learn anything, and it's not for you." And I basically said, "Bill, I need a job, uh, so you know I'll I'll take it." And he said, "Well, it pays twenty five dollars a week." I said, "Well." That's fine. He says, if you really want it, I'll get you 30. And that was the litigation department of Dreyer and Traub, which at that time was a premier real estate firm and was for a number, any number of years. So now you, you, you want to get out of litigation, and your friend was supposed to go up. The, they had two floors at 16 courts at that time. And your, your friend um, was supposed to get the job in the regular real estate department, and he got drafted. That's right. That's what happened. The Army did me a service. Uh, yes, actually, I had no intentions of getting out of litigation. I was there. That was the spot where I went. But the money and the, the, the profits for the firm were really made in doing real estate deals, uh, leases, acquisitions, and so forth. And, and that was on the second level. Right. And that really gave you the, the impetus to, to make your next career change because at that time you did a lease. You did a lease with regard to this elevator situation, right? Tell me the story yeah. about that. Well, I did a lot of leases. I said, but, that, but there was a yeah, that was the lease. One. Yeah, that was different one. No, Murray Felton was superb draftsman, superb technician, and I was physically physically in his office at a desk alongside, a, you know, in a, in a corner of one of his, and I learned a lot about real estate and drafting documents. And uh, one of the documents which I drafted was a lease, and the landlord was Saul Goldman and Alex DiLorenzo, and they were too cheap to hire a lawyer, so they said, would I draft a lease, which is unusual let the tenant's attorney draft a lease for the landlord, and I did. And I drafted it in such a way that there was an elevator, and if the elevator wasn't, before it was in operation, the tenant didn't have to pay any rent. And then the building... The city, con the the city condemned the elevator, and it took like oh, more than a year to fix and the tenant didn't pay any rent. The landlord wasn't too happy. I didn't, it was fine. And actually I told the tenant, you ought to, you're using this space full time. You ought to pay the landlord half rent at least. And the uh, client said, uh, when I need a uh, lecture on ethics, I'll come to you and refused to pay. So now you're at Dry and Traub, you're 26 years of age and you go to Abe Traub and you say to him, What's my opportunity to become a partner? And his comment to you was? Well, yeah, I said, no, I want to be. A, I want to know that I have an opportunity to be a partner. Not now, but certainly after I've been here 10 years, because I was doing a lot of work and uh, really made uh, substantial improvement or additions to the firm. And he said, uh, I don't make partners, so you'll never be a partner here. And I said, well, if I'll never be a partner here, that's, not, uh, that's really not for me. I will be you know, leaving. And he said, Go ahead and leave. That's but fine. But he said the door is, will always be will always open. Always be open at that point. Anytime you want to come back. So how do you now? You had negotiated this lease against Goldman and Di Lorenzo, and at this time they they only had owned I think it was eighteen properties because by the time you left them there were seven hundred and twenty properties that they had acquired during that period of time. How how they come out after the twenty six year old kid, you know, to become their general counsel to run their their legal operation. Well, we were involved. They had met me, uh, they, and I found out, uh, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but they found out that I was interested in leaving. I may have mentioned it to them, uh, not thinking that they would make me any kind of an offer. And then they did make me an offer and said, we'd like you to be our house counsel and come come with us. And I said, why me? And they said, well, because of the leases you drafted, you cost us a hundred grand, and I'd like you to get the hundred grand back from somebody else. So uh, that was really the start of now, uh, these were two, you know, as one would say, they were characters in the real estate industry. But they were characters. There's no question about that. I mean, you know, they were. But at that time, they were real estate in New York. Any deal that came out, they got first. Would we call them a deal junkie? Uh, yes, but they had good sources for getting secondary funds. Right. 
And uh, the answer was, yeah, they were. Right, and and you said to me that I think it was I think it was Saul who who you work with more often with, and Saul Goldman would say, look, if there's a defect, I don't mind because then you'd be able to negotiate a better price for me, right? We're, we're... Yeah, so I'll, they, I learned that there was a tremendous difference between the practice of real estate law and the practice of real estate, and that people or developers or looking to acquire real estate have an entirely different mindset than the lawyers. The lawyers see legal problems and they say to the client, you have a, this is a problem. And Goldman was different. If he had a problem, he would say, if there were a problem, he would say, well, should I not, should I not buy the property? And if my answer was say, well, I wouldn't not buy the property because of the problem, and then he'd say, how much can I get off as a result of the problem? So I had to now make some kind of an evaluation as to what the value of the de defect was to a developer or a, a, you know a, a, a somebody who was interested in buying a property. You know, during the Apprentice stage, which we still are on the show right now, you wrote two books, one of them on strategy and negotiation strategy. And you, you wrote in the book and you said to me when we met that when you were young, you really gained insight on negotiation and strategy by following other attorneys. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I did that. Uh, I was young, and since Goldman and De Lorenzo were multimillionaires, and we're dealing with uh, transactions which involved a lot of zeros, uh, usually the lawyer on the other side was much more was much older, more seasoned, and I looked very young. So uh, they thought I was a boy genius if I can represent these millionaires doing these deals, and I was not. Uh, at this, I was totally green in the acquisition mode of real estate. And they took advantage of me, and they were happy to, to take advantage of me. And I didn't even realize they were taking advantage of me for several years later. Now, there's one, I mean, there are many stories, you know, I think there's the Harborside story in Jersey City, but I think the really good story about the time, let's say your apprenticeship of your 10 years with Goldman De Lorenz is the story with Bill Zeckendorf, and the Gray Bar Building and the Chrysler Building. Why don't you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, well, Bill Zeckendorf was a great, well, I have to go this back. This is the original Bill Zeckendorf. Oh, yes, you go back to the point of time. Bill Zeckendorf Sr. was a genius, no question. He's a real estate genius, probably far ahead of his time, and uh, had great ideas. And basically, I had never met him, and the first time that I did meet him, he was very intimidating. But at this point, I was not, being intimidated by anybody. I had earned my stripes, so to speak. So he had a, made a deal where effectively he sold Saul Goldman the uh, Gray Bar building. And the Gray Bar building uh, physically closed. He signed the lease, and that was the, that was the sale. Uh, the, but the lease had to get the approval of, the insurance, of the insurance company. And if not, it, it had to be reassigned back by the end of December to go back, otherwise the insurance company was gonna call it and could call it in default. And it was a substantial purchase price paid for four million dollars for the leasehold. And we physically ran I physically ran the building in the interim period for the few months. Then when I, I push came to shove, I got nervous because the consent of the insurance company never came in. And although Zeckendorf said, Yes, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, I promise it. So, and I finally got nervous when he got into December, the middle of December, and I said to Saul, I'm not happy, and I'm gonna call the insurance company. And then there's the December 31st story, the New Year's That's, that's right. Now, so now he came and I called him, now it's, it's middle of December, and the person that I speak to at the insurance company says, I told Zeckendorf months ago, we were not going to approve the assignment. And unless he got it, unless he got it back, uh, it was reconveyed back, we were going to call the lease in default. And now I found out that Zeckendorf basically was not to be trusted because he kept telling me that I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And the truth of the matter is he knew that he wasn't going to get it a substantial period of time and we should never have gone down this road. Uh, he also uh, then sold the building, sold the leasehold to somebody else at a higher price, which we didn't know until much later. So now it turned out that there was a penalty involved of four hundred thousand dollars, if he didn't, if you never got the approval of the the, the 
life insurance company, which he didn't. And he had to give back all the money, plus all the any profits that we had along the way, plus four hundred thousand dollars. And uh, basically, it had to be done by December thirty first. If it wasn't done by December thirty first, then effectively the insurance company was going to call a lease of default. So at that time and point, I had absolutely no trust of uh, Webb and Knapp, Zeckendorf, the whole organization, because they should, it should never have happened. They should have owned up and said, I'm not going to get it, and then made arrangements to give it back nicely, quietly. And actually, at the time, it didn't even look like he was going to give it back. And when I told uh, Saul Goldman that you're not getting your money back, he made an appointment where we had to see Bill Zeckendorf in his office. And at that point, Goldman said to him, uh, you watch a program, there's a program on television. It starts off, news was made this day by. He says, you're going to watch it tonight. And they're going to tell you Webb and Knapp has been uh, accused of fraud in, a, in manipulating a real estate deal. So effectively, you're going to be out of business because they were, in fact, a public company. And Zeckendorf says, Saw, you're absolutely right. I owe you the money, but I haven't got it. And Goldman says, well, you better get it because otherwise at that point you got serious problems. Right, and subsequently in that situation, you got the Graybar building, and then that even aided you to get the Chrysler building. Yeah, the Graybar building, they went on, he said uh, that, uh, he, that uh, I will get you the assignment and done at this point. And to, you wait till the end of the month. If you wait till the end of the month, I will give you an option to buy the Chrysler building. And that, I knew, also needed the consent at that time of Lazard Frears. I said, well, what happens if you don't get the consent of Lazard Frears? I'll give you $250,000 for the fact that I couldn't get the consent. So now we've got all of these things. We've got the $4,400,000 penalty, 250 if it doesn't close by December 31st, and we're all set to go on December 31st. The interesting thing, it's 1966 right now, and you have a brother-in-law who came out of Katz Communications, the advertising. Correct. And he says to his, his third, uh, you were 38 at this time, your old brother-in-law, you know what, Saul, uh, George, let's go into the, the radio business, right? Yeah, he said that he, uh, his, his theory was that he was, they had, Katz had mandatory retirement at age 60. He was a vibrant, very vibrant guy. He said, I'm not ready to retire at age 60. We ought to form a partnership. We'll do real estate and we'll do radio. And I said, I don't know anything about radio. He says, but I do. And, and you knew business, so that was. And he said, uh, you don't, I said, you don't know anything about real estate, he says, but you do. So between us at this point, we'll work out the. So what was the first station you bought? This little station, right? The first station we bought was WGLI. At a, it came out of Babylon, New York. And bought that just by going through the yellow pages. And I said, I figured, how do you buy a radio station? I didn't know. So I went through the yellow pages and called these stations, are you for sale? Finally got one that said, yes, I'm for sale. That was the AM station. And then later on... Then the AM. Then you bought the FM station, right? Yeah, the FM station, but not from the same, same right. people, right. Right, and yeah. you changed the, the format of the music. Correct. Like, uh, uh, no, we changed the format. We bought, a, we bought GLI at that, the price, the, uh, they wanted 500000 all cash, which I didn't know was a... I knew, don't know how we're going to raise the money, but I didn't know it's a good price or not a good price. But I spoke to my brother in law, he said they've got a very good signal during the day, at night, you'll hear it in Bermuda, but you're not going to hear it anywhere else. But it's offering 450 all cash. So I said, Well, what, how do we get 450 all cash? You went out and sent the He said, Well, you figure it out. He says, So I said, How much do you guys? He says, 30 grand. I said, I got 30 grand, so we got 60. We'll figure out the rest. But it was, it never happened because they wouldn't take the 450 all cash. And the told me no, and the month went by, and then they called me, said, we'll take your offer. And then you said... And I said, wait a minute, at this point, now I'm not in my ballpark, it's, I'm not going to give you, you off what offer? I'm all tied up in real estate. So when you leave, when you start Beck Ross with your brother-in-law, you also leave Goldman D. Lorenz, and you go back, because the door was always open, at Dreyer and Traub. That's correct. And at this time, Abe Traub had, had had two heart attacks. Yeah, but you have to, it was a difference. When I went back to Dreyer and Traub, I also had... WGLI, and right. I had to offer it to the firm. Right. So I offered it to the firm, which was there, and Abe Traub looked at the looked at the finance. He says, George, I don't know how to tell you this, but that station is bankrupt. 
So I said, well, does that mean the firm doesn't want to go into it? He says, yes, we wouldn't go into it. I wouldn't ask you, wouldn't recommend that you go into it. But what he didn't realize, what, it's not like real estate. Radio stations, there's such an, there's an element of goodwill, which doesn't show up on the books. So the question is, what's the value of the license and the goodwill that goes with it? If you put that into the, into the equation, then it makes money. Now, the interesting situation is when you came back in 1966, you meet this 27-year-old kid uh, who uh, said he wanted to uh, take over the Hotel Commodore, right? Correct. And this kid's name was Donald Trump. That's right. And he sits down, and I think it was you who gave him the advice because he was dealing with the Pritzkers out, out of Chicago, it's a really good family. And you said to him, you know what? If you really want to go in front of the people, you got to hire a really good guy for the banking, and that was Henry Pierce. Well, that was yeah, but that was not my idea. It was Donald's idea. You know that uh, in all fairness, he knew Henry Pierce. He said, "What do you think of Henry Pierce?" I says, "He's a legend in the industry, and uh, he would be very helpful because there were a lot of political connotations that were involved at that time with the mayor and the city and the governor." And I said, "Henry Pierce gives you credibility." because Donald didn't have it at that time. He never built anything, and he was young. Right, so well, that's one of the major transactions is the, the Grand Hyatt with, with Donald. And then you take you get involved with one of the, the first condo conversions ever, you know, the Olympic Towers. Correct. How'd that happen? Well, uh, what happened is when I left Goldman Di Lorenzo and I went back to Dreyer and Traub on the firm, I got uh, Arthur Cohn was the major client that I was representing, and he basically was built, built Olympic Tower in uh, conjunction with Aristotle Onassis and uh, Michel Michel Uh And at the time he built it, it was a multi-use building, stores on the bottom, offices in the middle, and co-op units above. And at one point he said, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it into a condo. Can I do that? And I checked, and there was no statute that said you can't do it. And I said, why not? I'll see. I think we can get it past the attorney general because there's no prohibition. And effectively, that became the first mixed-use condominium building in the city of New York. Now, you were also involved with the St. Regis. Correct. But what happened over there? Well, no, St. Regis, I was involved with the St. Regis before. That was early. With, that was Goldman Di Lorenzo. Oh, that was a Goldman yeah. So I, that was long gone. And those. At one time, Goldman Di Lorenzo owned three three of those properties on 55th and 5th. So now this is, okay, you, you go back, Beck Ross, and back to Dryer and Traub, and now it's 1986, right? And in 1986, uh, what happens? Well, 1986, we had been, we, we built, Beck, Beck Ross, the, the communications was, was booming. It, we, we built it into a real monster. It was making a lot of money and had very good ratings. And at that time, uh, there was a, an opportunity for a lot of companies to get into radio and they could have media in any one area and they could have television and AM, FM, and uh, they could, uh, previously you could only have one. So it now opened it to uh, major companies like uh, Clear Channel and Infinity and the choice was either we expand or sell. And you sold. And we sold. And what happens to Dryer and Traub at this time? Uh, uh, Dryer and Traub was still, in, still doing fine. He's still in business in the, in the 86 when we sold. And uh, later on, at that, there was a falling out between me and my partners. And then you go to work with the, the legendary Edward Gordon. Correct. Where you're an advisor, a senior advisor, and so on. And subsequently, you always kept in touch with Donald Trump. Yeah. And, and in the early 90s, Donald Trump owed, a, owed the banks, what, $990 million? That's right. And you were keeping in touch with him. And in 1996, you decide to leave Eddie Gordon. And what happens with you and Donald Trump? Well, 1996, I had still, uh, when I was involved with Donald at this point, we, I was very much involved in Trump Tower for Donald. And it was interesting that he couldn't have uh, be, the uh, merger that he did with Equitable Life provided that the lawyer for the joint venture could not be the lawyer for either of the ventures. So I was couldn't be the lawyer. And Donald, I'll never forget, said, George, I won't do the deal with Equitable 
because you're not the lawyer. And I said, Donald, that's ridiculous. They're giving you back all your money, giving you a substantial profit. We'll make it up on other deals. And as part of the Trump Tower deal, I got to represent Leonard Kandel and the estate of Leonard Kandel, who was involved in the Trump Tower deal, albeit on the other side from Donald. So I still had the relationship while Trump Tower was being built. If Donald had anything he needed with Kandel, he would have to call me. Right. One of the major transactions that you get involved with is when Donald buys 40 Wall, 40 Wall Street. Basically a vacant building. It time. was, except for one a law firm f had five floors upstairs. Right, and, but the vacant building, and what did he pay? A million dollars? A million dollars, a dollar a square foot. A dollar a square foot. And uh, because the other people who were very bright people, the Resnicks, had just bought it and lost the building. Correct. So, uh, and you get involved with the leasing of the building, right? Right. And subsequently over there, you make a deal when you go back to Donald saying, hey, I want, I'm going to come back, but I'm going to work four days a week and I'm going to have some other latitude over there. How, what happened in, how did you get involved with Donald and The Apprentice? Uh, I got involved with Donald and The Apprentice, which purely as I was a fluke. Uh, Donald told me at one time, I walked into his office, I'm in interested in doing this show. And he gave me the format of the show. He says, I need a judge. I'd like you to be a judge. It'll take you three hours a week. So I said, three hours a week is easy at that point because it was on his time anyway. But of course, it wasn't. It was a lot more than three hours a week. It was until I got involved with the fourth episode, I realized I shouldn't be there because it was taking up too much time. But it had a tremendous acceptance. It became very popular. And it uh, some of the popularity rubbed off on me as a judge. It enabled me to write two books because now I was Trump's right-hand man because I was on the right hand so the right side in the stage and effectively I wrote a book on real estate and another book on negotiation because I had taught a course in negotiation at NYU for about 20 years. Now let's talk about the family. You married to 59 years, your wife? Right, absolutely. My wife, Billy, wonderful wife. And you have daughters, right? Two daughters. And their names? Nancy and Stephanie. And grandchildren? Uh, yes, I have uh, three granddaughters through my oldest. Their names? I mean... Names are Barry and Erica and Emily. So, you know, for, for the kid who grew up in Brooklyn who wanted to go to MIT and become an engineer, you became a great negotiator. You became a true uh, builder of New York and a New York personality, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.